What's going on, everybody? This is Black Men Sundays. I'm your host, Corey Sylvester Murray, and we're talking about generational wealth, mental health, finance, and business. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away. I refuse to be the man I was yesterday. Gotta put my best And don't forget, this year, we're doing our second annual turkey drive. We're giving turkeys to three boys and girls clubs of Central Florida. So today's show, that's what we're talking about. And guess who we're talking to? We have the president and CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Central Florida. That's over 12,000 youth expanding five counties, 38 clubs. So I think that's like one of the top boys and girls clubs in the nation. And just a fun fact about our guest today, she was also named one of 2024's top 50 women leaders in Florida. So without further ado, Jamie Merrill, welcome to Black Men Sundays. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Definitely, definitely. And let's let's just warm up a little bit. Tell me about the Boys and Girls Club of Central Florida, because a lot of our listeners are in Central Florida, but we also have a worldwide audience. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I think you started off really well, right? So we have 38 clubs that span across five counties, and we support over 12,000 kids school age. So ranging from the ages of six all the way to 18, but certainly we don't even uh, just graduate them and then send them off. We cert- we help to make sure that they continue off on a good path and have even different programs like Club Blue and helping them to get further connected in the next stages of their life and even possible board service that they can do with us and helping them continue to resume build. So there's a lot of wonderful things that we do. We are always putting ourselves into communities where the kids need us most. And we are very prideful in what we do, which is focus on breaking the cycle of generational poverty. Oh, great. And that leads right to my next question. Our show's about generational wealth. So what financial challenges do the club families face? You know, that's a really good question. So I, I mean, let me start with just a few statistics and metrics right now. So you've got over 95, somewhere between 95 to 98%, depending on where you're looking and in what county of, of kids who are qualifying for free and reduced lunch. And typically we see somewhere between 85 to 90% of the families that we serve and the kids that we serve are have a household income of less than 40,000. So that is huge, right? And those are right there along with inflation that you already talked about earlier. It's being able to support families with the continued inflation that they have making decisions between do I pay a rent or a mortgage or do I feed my family? These are decisions that frankly our families and parents no matter where you are should never have to face in today's day and age, but it is a reality of what it is that they do. So it's important to us that we're constantly focusing on breaking that cycle by building up the knowledge base of the kids that we serve so they can go out and make better decisions and know exactly what they're up against. Great information, okay. And how do you teach the club youth and families financial literacy? So many ways. I'll, I'll tell you one of the most successful and fun that I love. So we have a program called Money Matters, and we partner with quite a few different institutions that help us to teach the Money Matters. It's a big part of financial literacy. So in the summer times, we have the kids typically all day, you know, during non-school hours. But so we are a lot of times focusing on those um, non-school hours to really run this program more deliberately and with intention. A lot of times we'll do it during the school year too, but we have to break it up in cycles. So Money Matters is an opportunity where our club members get paired with mentors out in the the workforce, right? So whether that's um, different, you know, financial institutions or financial advisors or whoever it is that's helping us to run the program. And they're going to learn all of these different metrics like how to save money, creating um, and maintaining budgets, They're figuring out how to distinguish between needs and wants, putting a savings cushion in there, what should make a purchase, what inflation means, all of those things. What's really cool, though, is we once the course has run, we then do something called a reality store. 
And the reality store is where the rubber meets the road, right? And where it gets real fun with the youth. And so we set up these opportunities where each individual club member is given a different scenario and they have to play out that scenario of quote unquote life in the reality of what it is that they're given and help to make financial decisions, whether it be purchases or childcare, whether it be medical decisions, some are given certain careers, you know, some are given careers that maybe they didn't want. In fact, at one point uh, we had uh, one of our youth members come back and say, can I give this child back on paper? They're, they cost too much money. And but it's really helping them to understand the real life scenarios of what has to be done and the decisions, the difficult decisions sometimes that not only their parents go through and guardians go through, but that they're going to have to be up against and helping them to set the path at an early age. Great information. Yeah, you mentioned budgeting and saving. You know, that's kind of a challenge during this inflation, you know. So why is it so important to teach you know, the youth and teens about budgeting and saving the importance of that at an early age? Yeah, great question. You know, I think early on, I, I spoke about one of the things that we really focus on is breaking the cycle of generational poverty. Oftentimes, we know that our club members can't necessarily see beyond, you know, four to six blocks that are out in front of them. And so they don't really understand the opportunities that the world can offer. And that's where we pride ourselves on helping to open those doors and open their eyes to the world of possibilities of what it is that they can explore. But if we don't teach them those key fundamentals of budgeting and saving money, they can go out and get great jobs and still not be making good decisions because they have not necessarily been taught that in any of the life situations that they've been a part of. So helping them to truly break that cycle means looking at every aspect of their life and the situation that they've been involved in and helping to ensure that they're going to overcome that in the best way possible. And that is why we focus on financial literacy and money matters. And a lot of times we've seen our kids be able to start their own businesses, you know, hold down a job, create savings, and they put more of a savings in when they're graduating from high school, they have more of a savings cushion already than maybe even their family does. And it's setting them off on the right path. Well, that's great information. Yeah, because on our show, we talk about generational wealth, generational poverty. We also talk about generational mental health that gets passed down. But let's talk about, you know, how the organization is closing the opportunity gap. I know you mentioned a few, but if you want to just go a little deeper. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to share a story with you. We had a club member who came to us in sixth grade. And because of the fact that he was from a neighborhood that had very high gang rates, he had siblings, unfortunately, that were already initiated into gangs, in addition to, you know, drugs and all of those other things uh, that he has to walk past even in order to get to school. When he joined the club, one of the things that was asked of him was, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a drug dealer. They have the money. They have the cars. They have, um, you know, what it is that I can see through the time that he and the years that he was with us and he's graduated high school now, which is great. But through the years that he was with us, he was able to really, truly see all of the wonderful opportunities that were out there, being able to apply himself, get excited about getting his grades where he was previously failing. And, you know, we were able to get him up to having straight A's inside of the club with the mentors that he had. He became a lover of STEM programs, and he actually ended up going to college for industrial engineering. And so this, this opportunity that he never knew was possible in a world that he didn't even know was possible and a profession that he didn't know was possible became his love. And that's where he ended up going because we were able to show him all of the different capabilities of how to apply himself and the talents that he naturally had. And so that's really what we talk about. And I feel like that story really showcases exactly what we do. We focus on each and every individual and each and every child and meeting them where they're at. And that is often different with every single individual, but helping them understand that where they're at is okay. We're going to help them to continue to move forward at the pace that they're, that they need to move. 
Uh, but getting them involved in the arts and, and STEM and reading programs, helping our children learn to read and be sophisticated in reading and in math often enlightens them in so many ways that they never knew possible. I mean, teaching children even how to speak English when English wasn't their first language, turn around and watch them teach their parents English who didn't speak it before. Those are the success metrics of being able to turn the future generations forward and break that cycle and bridge the opportunity gap altogether. So, you know, uh, last year we did our first Black Men Sunday's Turkey Drive. We did um, the Universal location and the Winter Garden location. And one thing that I was impressed about just dropping the turkeys off, I was like the size of the club, the facilities. And the best part for me is dropping the turkeys off. I'm walking, you know, walking past the kitchen to get to the freezer. I'm like, wow, this food smells really good. It doesn't smell like what I would assume would be like cafeteria food. I'm like, this food is like really good. Not that I've had any, but I'm just saying I've smelled it though. So, but um, how would the turkey drive support your club families this year? Sure. And I have had the food, by the way. So let me just say that. And I often tell people I eat the food and the food is wonderful. One thing that I always love to share with everybody is, unfortunately, when we have families that are making those really tough decisions on, do I keep a house and a, a, a roof over my child's head or, you know, do I um, support them with food? These are decisions, like I said before, that no family, no individual with children should ever have to make for themselves or the ones that they love. But it is the reality of what, what is happening out there on a daily basis. And inflation just certainly makes that so much worse. So we are very thankful to be able to have partners and opportunities and these wonderful kitchens and food that allows us to feed our club members on a daily basis. So in after school times when they're in school, they're getting a, a full meal and a snack with us. They're getting three meals a day with us when we have them all day long in the summer and on breaks because we don't know when their next meal is. But we also know that, and this is what goes to the turkey drive, our children are not going to be as successful as they need to. They're not going to have that focus on literacy and STEM. They're not going to be excited to take that next step that is going to bridge the gap and help them to become the best versions of themselves if they're hungry. And that is why it's so important that we focus on this. So that goes right into your question of why is this so important with the turkey drives? Well, because at the end of the day, our kids deserve to feel exactly what the rest of the world feels and celebrate these wonderful holidays. And when I told you earlier that, you know, somewhere between 85 to 90 percent of our families are making forty thousand dollars or less as a household income, it may not be a luxury that they have to go out and actually spend on a holiday meal or a Thanksgiving meal. So it's important that we give them opportunities both inside the club to have those hot meals, but also that experience in the home so that they can celebrate as well. Sometimes you're dealing with homes that have you know, upwards of 10 to 12 people living in them and they're having to feed all of those individuals. So this is giving them the luxury to feel not only nourished with the meal that they're getting, but feel whole as an individual, which is something that is incredibly important to their mental health and the well-being of the children and the entire family. Yeah, that's great information. Yeah, because I know last year when we were doing our distribution day at the Universal location, just, you know, seeing the family, seeing the club members picking up the turkeys, because, you know, before that, you're kind of locked in into the donations and the shopping. So you kind of don't have the emotional side of it yet. You're kind of so locked in to the you know the technicalities of making sure that you have everything but on that day it just I just felt like wow this is really awesome you know um when when the family members you know I got hugs took pictures gave them the turkey and then last year we also did for like the first 50 members we gave them like a full meal that they so you know I thought that was pretty cool so if I'm a family member or parent of a student and I live kind of near one of the boys and girls clubs but I'm a little apprehensive to have my child go there after school, you know, outside of this great information that you gave us today, but how can we comfort some of the parents that, you know, they may work long hours. So instead of having their child at home, that would be a great alternative. But what about the parents that are a little apprehensive to send their child to a boys and girls club? I was a single mom and I will tell you, and I, and I love to share this with people and I specifically share it with a lot of parents 
I was a single mom who at one point had her lights turned off on her and was on Medicaid and completely understand, you know, all of the things that you're doing. And you're working so hard to just be able to get home to your children and do the very best that you can. And that's really all that you can think about. I wish that I would have had a club like this for my daughter to go to at that time. And what I would say to those parents and what I often say is come see us, come see us because it will change every ounce of hesitation that you have when every child is welcomed for whoever it is that they are. When we are simply just thankful to be a part of every parent's village, we don't try to take the, the child rearing or parenting or anything on ours. We just recognize that we are a part of that village. And that is one of the reasons that we have been focusing so much on providing holistic resources to our families and not just the children. We recognize that the success of a child is not simply solely based on what happens inside of the walls of our club. And we we find it really necessary to be able to help them make good decisions and also support the network of individuals that are around them. That's helping to bridge and connect the club, with the home, with the community, with a network of resources that are out there, things like, you know, career source and helping families to be able to find a new job or resource, other resources that are out there from mental health services to support services, tax services, things like that, that we're helping to bridge the gap uh, with our other community partners inside the club because they're used to coming to us. So come and see us, come see what we do, have your child come see it. And I can assure you that they will be welcomed with open arms and you will be able to breathe a sigh of relief. And I have two more questions for you. This will be the hardest question. Are you enjoying yourself on Black Men Sundays? Very much so. I, As you can see, I'm very passionate about what I do and I love all the kids that we serve. And so anytime I have an opportunity to speak about it, I'm more than happy to do it. And I'm really excited that you invited me here today. I wanted to invite you last year, but the timing was a little weird. So as soon as I started doing the turkey drive this year, I said, okay, we have to get Jamie Merrill on Black yes, Men Sundays. And, and then I've been talking to uh, Danny. So back and forth, you know, setting everything up logistically. So I just kind of, you know, took my shot, you know, like they say, if you don't take the shot, you don't know if you're going to make it or not, you know, and if you don't take the shot, you've already missed it. Actually, that's how I look at it. So definitely. So before we get out of here, I want to ask you, you know, when we talk about investing home ownership, whether it's crypto, whether it's stock, from your point of view, what has worked successfully for you investing or do you invest? I do invest. Absolutely. And from a personal perspective, you know, I would say I've invested in homes and that has continued to pay off. But we I also invest in lots of different ways. You one of the things that I always help to share with people, though, is making sure that you have enough to cover what you're currently spending on a monthly basis, because investing is great. But if you're strapping yourself so thin that you can't do what you need to do on a monthly basis, then we need to look at other avenues of where we can be able to invest. Investing sets up the long-term future, right? And that's the difference between short-term and long-term. The short-term gain is, you know, I have the paycheck coming in right now, I have to pay my bills, but investing is continuing to set up the, the, the long-term future for your retirement, for your kids, for anything else that you, that you potentially are wanting to do. So being able to play the short game and the long game is really critical. Yeah. So, you know, just looking at your background, I saw that, you know, you've served on boards. So, mm -hmm. you know, for business owners or for entrepreneurs that, you know, want to be more active in the community, what's the importance of serving on boards? Oh, I could speak about this all day long. And thank you for asking that question. So I'm, I'm a huge believer in finding your passion, right? And while I have the benefit and have had the benefit of marrying my personal passion with my profession, which so many people don't necessarily have the opportunity to do, um, marrying their personal side with their professional side of, of supporting kids, being able to serve on boards is something that is helping to deliver where you want the community to go and being a part of the solution. It's a feel good. It allows you to be part of that. It allows you to get involved with whatever it is, whether it's kids, whether it's healthcare, whether it's seniors, whether it's whatever um, is truly your passion. Serving on boards allows you to invest your time, both personally and professionally, 
especially when it comes to nonprofits. Nonprofits need expertise, right? We seek individuals from all different walks of life and industries to be able to help us make the best type of decisions. In our in our board and with our organization, we are raising up the future generations. And that means that every child has a different goal and a different thought process and is individually unique, which means I want to pull from all different walks of life and professions to help us to either get involved in a new program, volunteering, make the best decisions about the organization's financials. Um, and that allows us to have a multitude of resources out there and more people continuing to sell the mission of what it is that we do. And it, it just continues to keep the world going round in a good way. So I'm always a big advocate for getting people involved in boards and leadership positions and whatever it is your passion is, serve and find that because you will find that you're more personally excited and passionate about life and doing what you have to do if you're filling your cup with what drives you on a daily basis as well. Great information. And I kind of want to take it back, you know, earlier, you know, you said you were a single mom, you had mm -hmm. the lights cut out. So for the single moms out here listening that have experienced that or, or are experiencing that, let's take a step back with you. How did you go from, you know, single mom with the lights out to serving on these boards, executive president? Like, how did you, like, if I was talking to the 20 year old Jamie Merrill, how did you go from where you were then to now from a success okay. perspective? I thank you. That's a great question. And I get asked that question on a regular basis. Uh, you know, one of the things that I did was when I was at work or needed to do something, I was all in and I was focused, but I found a way to balance my personal life with my professional life because I wasn't a hundred percent myself in the professional world if I was not giving to my daughter and I felt completely depleted. So it was important to me that I found those times to really be able to give to her, um, but it was a struggle. And so I, I kept her as my, my goal and my focus of what I wanted to do better for. And I strived, I went, I went back to school. I took other classes. I took leadership classes, sometimes at night after she went to bed and learned how to manage through different techniques and opportunities. And every step of the way, I went out for a new position after I had become an expert in the position that I was in. And that's one of the things that I say to everybody. Oftentimes we want to reach the next level, but if we haven't become an expert, in what we're currently doing, it's hard to reach the next level. So focus on becoming an expert in wherever you are right now. Once you hit that, then you hit the next level. Once you get to the top, now you're an expert in all of these things and you have the life lessons to be able to mentor other people along the way. Oh, wow. That was awesome. And before I let you go, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you would like to mention? Just thank you for believing in us. Thank you for the turkey drive. Thank you for inviting me here, but more so, and I, I say this to everybody, it's not even so much believing in us. Thank you for believing in our kids and knowing that they can go out and change the world and everything that you do to support us shows that. So I really, truly appreciate it. Definitely. And I enjoy doing it. Um, This is our second annual. I hope to make this a yearly thing and add a new club each year because, you know, 38 clubs, it'd be great to feed all 38 clubs. It would. Definitely. But I'm, you know, taking it a step at a time. So I definitely appreciate you coming on Black Men Sundays. Jamie Merrill, president and CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Central Florida. And keep in mind, we're doing our second annual turkey drive. You see that QR code on your screen if you're watching it on YouTube. If you're listening on your podcast, just scroll down to our description and click that link to make our donation. We're doing donations until November 20th. So Get your donation in. Let's feed these kids. Gobble, gobble. And thanks for listening to Black Men Sundays. Have a great evening and a great work week. It's a Black Man Sunday.